I'm a nature photographer. My expertise comes from what I've witnessed in wild places like the forest of Borneo and from what I've learned by living with wild animals like lions in Botswana. Yet by training, I'm an environmental economist. I was born and raised in Holland and I moved to California in the late 70s to do research. But like many newcomers to the West Coast, I had a dream. I wanted to work with nature. I plunged into photography without knowing what I was getting into. And in those early days, it was the animals who taught me. My job became to make them look good, which in the case of elephant seals is a little bit challenging. <laughs> I began to work with animals, one on one, one species at a time. There's no school for this kind of work. You have to improvise in the field, make things up, and I've done some crazy things over the years. I'm from a flat country, and I have terrible fear of heights. But from this scary platform, 80 feet off the forest floor in the Amazon, I had amazing views of macaws flying around in a tree canopy. For years, I loved the excitement of working with big animals up close. Now, in a situation like this, it helps to know the difference between a bluff and a real charge. <laughs> but over time, I began to look at animals less as photographic trophies and more as ambassadors for ecosystems. And when biologist E.O. Wilson came up with a new concept of nature, the notion of biodiversity, I embraced that as a new challenge for myself as a photographer. Showing a single species in a photograph is one thing, but how do you show the essence of nature as a network of relations between many different species? That was a key question when I took on a National Geographic assignment about biodiversity issues, and that project led me to this place. New Jersey's Delaware Bay. I went there for the same reason all these birds are gathered there on the beach, horseshoe crabs. They come out of the water every spring to spawn at the tide line, and their eggs are prized protein for migratory birds. I went there not just for the animals. People have a really interesting relationship with those crabs. Fishermen exploit the resource. They take way too many of them, and that undermines the ecosystem. But there's also a new, more sustainable economy that is based on the harvesting of horseshoe crab blood. Their blood has unique properties that makes it ideal for testing of new drugs. And then there's Bob Barlow from Woods Hole. He studies the eyes of horseshoe crabs in the hope of finding ways to develop artificial eyesight for blind people. One reason Barlow studies those crabs is that they're so primitive. They're virtually unchanged over time. This fossilized crab may look like one today, but it is actually 150, years old, 150 million years old. And one evening, I watched something that took me far back in time. As the crabs came out of the water by the thousands and all references to the modern world faded away in twilight, I felt like I was transported back hundreds of millions of years. And I wondered, if I can experience this in New Jersey, what might I be able to capture elsewhere? And that was the beginning of an amazing personal journey. I became a time traveler with a camera and started looking all over the world for situations where I could see echoes of the past in the present, like the Galapagos. It's a place where mammals never made it, so you can still imagine the era when large land reptiles dominated the earth. And as I began to make new images, my vision grew. I decided to try and tell the story of life from its earliest beginnings to its present diversity, with each photo being a stepping stone in time. Here's one. This is a tuatara, a reptile that predates all the dinosaurs and it's outlived them all. Its origins go back more than 200 million years, but today it's found on only one tiny island off New Zealand. Now, the farther I went back in time with this journey, the harder the challenge became because I wanted to make each image true to a certain point in time without showing anything that evolved later on. Take this scene from Kamchatka, for instance. It shows an ecosystem from more than a billion years ago. 
made up of only algae and bacteria. And here, I had to make sure no plants or animals of any kind were visible because they simply didn't exist yet. Even farther back in time, I came upon fossilized stromatolites built layer upon layer by primitive cyanobacteria. They emerged three billion years ago. They were the first living things able to conduct photosynthesis. They released oxygen as a byproduct. And for two billion years, nearly half of the Earth's entire history, they had the world to themselves. There was no other life back then. Today, a remote lagoon in Western Australia is one of the last few places where they still exist. Now, I wanted to show them the way they were in the beginning. But back then, the sky was not yet blue. So I had to wait until dusk to make this image that represents to me a turning point for life. Because collectively, these stromatolites exhaled so much oxygen for such a long period of time that they changed the atmosphere. It's really humbling to think that every breath each of us takes in this room today comes from these ancient bacteria. It's quite simple. Without them, there would be no us. Before stromatolites came along, our planet was a hostile place. And at the edge of erupting volcanoes, you can still smell early Earth. It was different. It's not a healthy place to linger for long. You have to wear a gas mask. Chris, my partner, both in real life and in this life project, is standing next to me. She's also here today, but without the mask. With this project, we wanted to bridge the gap between nature and science and make the story of life accessible to everyone at a time when our survival depends on it. At the end of our field work, we put together a book, an exhibition, and we also created a multimedia performance with a musical score by composer Philip Glass that is now touring the world. Chris and I wrote a simple narrative, a libretto, if you will, that would tell the story of life from the beginning to the present. And now I would like to take you on a journey through time, sharing with you some of the highlights of that miraculous sequence of events using photos made in our own time, and yet they illuminate our planet's four and a half billion years of history. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's go. The journey of life starts in space, where energy becomes matter, turning into shapes over time, solidifying into spheres fueled by fire. Once fire gives way, Earth emerges. But this is an alien planet. The moon is closer. Things are different. Heat within Earth makes volcanoes erupt, exhaling gases into the sky. Geysers vent steam. And when Earth cools, rain falls for eons, giving birth to oceans. Water freezes around the poles, and it shapes the edges of the Earth. Water is a key to life, but in frozen form, it is a latent force. When water vanishes, Earth becomes like Mars. But our planet is restless. It roils in sight. And where that energy touches water, a new element appears, life. Life arises around cracks in the Earth Mother minerals become substrates where life begins to multiply, thickening in places, growing structures under a primeval sky. Once single cells can capture sunlight, they alter the atmosphere, creating a breath for all life thereafter, a breath that became fossilized as iron. Life needs a breath, and it needs a membrane too, so it can replicate and mutate. Shallow seas nurture life early on. That's where it grows into more complex forms. Life evolves when light and oxygen increase. It learns to move, and it begins to see. Vision is refined in horseshoe crabs, among the first to leave the sea. 
out of the sea, slugs become snails. And fish try amphibian life. Frogs adapt to deserts. Lichens develop as a co-op. Fungi bond with algae. They cling to rock and transform barren land. True land plants arise, leafless at first. Once they stay upright, they grow in size and shape. The fundamental forms of ferns follow, bearing spores that foreshadow seeds. Life flourishes in swamps. When a great change rocks the earth, continents get dry. And on land, life turns tough. Jaws form first, teeth come later. It takes time for life to break away from water, and it still beckons all the time. But with eggs and seeds, life has a chance on land to shelter new forms in the making. Life protects itself its scales and skin as it ventures farther inland. Some dragons from the past are still alive today. Dinosaur time shimmers on in parts of Madagascar and Brazil, where plants like cycads remain rock hard, and others still grow defenses against giants long gone. Conifers adapt to cooling in times when Earth turns frigid. But when Earth warms again, green forests nurture things with wings. One early form left an imprint like it fell only yesterday, while others fly today like visions from the past. In birds, life gains new mobility. Flamingos cover continents, migrations get underway. Birds witness the emergence of flowering plants. Water lilies are among the first. In Australia, an ordinary lily turns into an extraordinary grass tree, while in Hawaii, a tiny daisy becomes a giant silver sword. In Gondwana, drought molds Proteus. But when that ancient megacontinent breaks up, life gets lush. True jungles arise, sparking new layers of interdependence. Fungi multiply, and orchids emerge with genitalia shaped to lure insects. Coevolution entwines plants with insects and birds with plants. When birds can't fly, they become vulnerable. Extinction often comes slowly, but sometimes it happens fast. When an asteroid hits the Earth, a whole world vanishes in flames. But there are witnesses survivors in the dark. And when the sky is clear, a new world is born, a world fit for mammals. From tiny shrew-like creatures accustomed to the dark, new forms radiate. Bats take to the air. Civets slink along the ground. Hyenas emerge. Cheetahs get faster, and they prey faster still. Grasslands create new opportunities for hunters and for the hunted. Growing big is another answer, but size often comes at a price. There are many ways to be a mammal. Some turn back to water, sea lines get sleek, and dolphins move into a world without bounds. Primates evolve in jungles. Tarsius first, lemurs not much later. It's in lemurs that learning becomes reinforced. And when forests dry out once more, bands of apes venture into the open. And growing upright, going upright becomes a lifestyle. So who are we? Brothers of masculine chimps? Sisters of feminine bonobos? We are all of them and more. We are molded by the same force. The blood veins in our hands echo the coarse water traces on the earth. And our brains are celebrated brains 
reflect the drainage of a tidal marsh, but they enable us to do something new. We can imagine a whole earth with life as a force in its own, right? Life has altered the earth. It covers it like a skin. And where it does not, as in Greenland in winter, the margins for existence become clear. But as long as water is liquid, it is a womb for cells green with chlorophyll. And that molecular marvel has made the difference. It fuels everything on Earth. We live on oxygen produced by bacteria, algae, and now plants. Their waste is our breath, and our exhalation is theirs. We are connected, like water on land with clouds in the sky. This Earth is alive, and it's made its own membrane, a biosphere made of land, sea, and air, energized by all living things, forming a whole that is held together and sustained by the collective force of life. That's the story of life. From our perspective, as newcomers on this planet, it is amazing to consider how a naked piece of rock orbiting the sun became a living planet. In the 1970s, a man named James Lovelock had a revolutionary idea. He saw the Earth as a whole organism, with life as a whole, creating the conditions that help sustain itself. Now, I'm not a scientist, I'm a storyteller, and I love metaphors, but I think that Lovelock's theory, which he called Gaia, is one of the big ideas of our time. Long ago, Hindu philosophers recognized five elements, earth, air, fire, water, and space. To me, life is a sixth element. And I see all of humanity, all of us, as yet another element interacting with planet Earth. But only we have the ability to consciously alter our impact. Global warming is a clear indication of that planetary impact. And whether we're able to modify that impact is one of the big challenges of our generation. We are in the midst of a great extinction crisis. Kew Gardens in the UK is storing a billion seeds from tens of thousands of different kinds of plants in case they vanish in the wild. But we're also in the midst of an extraordinary era of new discoveries. We're adding new species to the tree of life every day. And with science, I believe, we have the power to change the Earth and the way we live on it. We're just beginning to tap into the wealth of biological ingenuity that has evolved over billions of years. Like these algae, living in snow at 15,000 feet, fried by sun during the day, frozen stone cold every night. And if horseshoe crabs can give us blood to test our drugs, and maybe contribute to eyesight for the blind, what other secrets may hide inside? I still photograph nature on my own, but I've become much more focused now on collaborating with scientists whose discoveries propel the story of life forward into new frontiers. I'm working with researchers who are exploring deep inside the human body, even inside single cells. And when science thinks big, there is no limit to what we can accomplish. This is CERN's Large Hadron Collider. It took thousands of people from dozens of countries working together for decades to put it together. It's aimed to study the origins of the universe. We produced a special version of our live concert to help inaugurate the LHC. And spending time there and witnessing the level of collaboration and commitment gave me hope that we as homo sapiens can harness that sapiens part of ourselves to actualize our human nature. We're looking out into space now, to other worlds beyond our own, to other galaxies that may harbor life, and to moons like Europa in our own solar system that may show us if life can adapt to the cold, briny seas believed to exist there miles below its surface. 
Last week, researchers from the University of California in Santa Cruz announced a sensational discovery, a distant Earth-like planet orbiting another sun 20 light years away. It's the first one found yet outside our own solar system that may be habitable. One scientist said she gave this planet a 90% chance to hold water, 90%. Another one said it's enough to give you goosebumps. I share that feeling. Yet the more we learn about our universe, the more we realize how precious our own planet is. This planet is breathtaking, but now we also know it is breath-making. So no matter whether you call it Gaia, or whole earth, or blue marble, no matter whether you believe in the omnipotence of a god or in the sheer force of life to express itself, this is the one thing we all have in common and the one thing we cannot live without. Thank you.